I've never been much of a man. I barely crack five foot six, can't handle my liquor, and I've never been in a fight in my life. But when Lainey got pregnant, I decided it was time for a change. I started working out. I learned how to change the oil and tires on the Buick. Hell, I even bought a pistol. I was going to protect them. Lainey and my unborn child. Whatever it took. I could tell Lainey thought it was all a little silly. My newfound quest for manhood. It was easy for her to say. She was doing her part. Carrying the burden of life inside her. While all I could do was hold her hair in the early stages of pregnancy as she puked into the toilet. And sometimes I even fucked that up. She seemed to think she could do it all by herself, and she was probably right. When I brought home the gun, she was livid. All we needed, she said, was a baseball bat, and someone strong enough to swing it, she might have added. I took it back the next day and bought a Louisville slugger instead. The baby came without a hitch. Little Annika, looking just like her mommy. And what we lacked in protection, Lainey made up for with near-neurotic preparation. She had it all, the books, the vitamins, the breastfeeding techniques, but perhaps her favorite new mommy toy came in the form of a kiddo's baby monitor that she got at the baby shower. I can't remember who gave it to her. It gave off a small hum. Scarcely a whisper every single night. Vague static, white noise erupted, only on occasion by a cough or a hiccup or whimper from sweet Annika. She wasn't a fussy baby at all. The monitor rested on Lainey's nightstand, securing my wife like a second quilt. A small red dot, indicating the device was alive and well, dimly bathed the room in crimson and an optional display provided a blue-tinted camera feed aimed at Annika's crib. We could hear her, we could see her, and all was well in paradise. Oh, there were tough times, sure. The jaundice was bad and it led to things even worse, pneumonia, strep. Infection's no fun for an adult, but an enormous goddamn deal for a baby. We spent plenty of time in the hospital. The nurses all loved Annika. They always remarked on how well-behaved a baby she was. The marriage grew stale, but what marriage doesn't? The sex was rare and forced, just another thing for Lainey to check off her to-do list. Was it ever really not that way, though? I tried to remember, but life before Annika seemed trapped in a cloudless haze. Becoming a father seemed to alter the very structure of my brain. The first year came and went. The kiddo's baby monitor ran out of batteries and we never bothered to replace them. Annika was crawling, then walking. The first words spoken at the dinner table, which Lainey and I were both there for. Mango. The words kept coming, mommy, diaper, fool. They were all expected, yet all met with excited applause from her mother and me. And then one day, while Lainey was at spinning class and I was doing the newspaper crossword on the couch, Annika piped up from her playpen with a word I did not expect. Father. I sat up, strainingly silent to listen. Sure, I had misheard, but then it came again, even clearer than before. Father. Most dads would be thrilled. I was confused and, frankly, a bit unnerved. I had no idea where she'd learned that. I was always daddy. In fact, as far as I'd seen, no one had ever so much as breathed that word in front of her. Yet, there she sat, squawking away, giving voice to a word uncomfortably formal as though it were the most natural thing in the world. Father, father, father. Lainey didn't seem as interested as I did. In fact, she seemed a little bit more than miffed. Annika had been growing more distant from her lately. This was the age children usually clung tightest to their mothers, yet Annika seemed to have no such proclivity. 
One doctor theorized that Annika might be having her needs met through another source. Did she have a stuffed animal she was particularly attached to? A blanket, maybe? We couldn't think of anything. We had her tested for autism. Hell, we had her tested for everything. Nothing could explain her level of detachment from us, nor her remarkably tame behavior. The professionals had never seen anything like it, but didn't seem to think it was much cause for concern. Count your blessings, friend. One of them told me in a heavy English accent as he escorted me from his office. Between you and me, nine out of ten kids her age is a right little shit. Still, we couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. One night, Lainey had decided she'd had enough. She dug the old kiddo's baby monitor out of the box in the attic. She put new batteries in it, rewired the camera in Annika's room, and for a few hours, the white noise hummed beneath our sleep once more. I awoke to the sound of Annika babbling away in her crib. I turned toward the monitor, and my eyes swam, barely open, in the sea of crimson from its light. She was repeating the same word again and again. Father, father. I rolled over towards Eleni. She was still asleep. Annika wasn't being very loud. I stumbled out of bed and wiped my eyes, picking up the monitor. My fingers fumbled for the switch on the back, and when I flicked it, a dull blue glow sprang from nowhere. I squinted my eyes to see Annika's crib, and then let out a straggled cry. The monitor slipped from my hands and crashed to the floor. Lainey woke with a start, mumbling, What's the matter? But I couldn't speak. Someone was holding my daughter. Without a word, I ran into the hallway, not even bothering to grab the Louisville slugger from the closet. The door to Annika's room was wide open. My socks slid out from underneath me, and I crashed onto the wooden hallway floor as I reached it. And as I lie prone, I had a clear view into the bedroom. Annika sat up in her crib, crying wildly for a change, startled by the noise. Nobody was holding her. I swear to God, honey. But Lainey wasn't having it. The first night we start using the monitor again, and it just happens to be the night an invisible man breaks into our house and leaves her placed all neat in her crib where he found her. He wasn't invisible, and I can't explain it. Lainey, I'm telling you what I saw. All right, she said, as though humoring a child. What did he look like? At this, I drew a blank. I couldn't exactly describe him. I hadn't looked long enough. I felt that I had seen him before, though. Somewhere, I felt, I felt that seeing him at all, even in a completely non-threatening context, would have made me deeply uncomfortable. But I didn't know how to explain this to Lainey, this vague recognition, so I just shrugged. She scoffed. Jesus, what am I supposed to do with this? But the whole thing had spooked her, I know it. That night she told me if you hear anything from the monitor, anything at all, you wake me right up. So I did. Father, father! Lainey's voice rang out above the dead white noise. Lainey snatched the cooing monitor from her bedside table, and then a second after I'd woken up, she sat up and flicked the switch. Lainey shrieked a horrible, sobbing shriek. She swung the covers from her and leapt from the bed in one fluid motion, leaving the monitor face up on the sheet beside her. On it, I could see the man, cradling Annika with a light bounce, more clearly this time. And in a flash, I knew exactly who he was, and this time, I stayed right where I lay. It took Lainey a long time to calm Annika down. That scream had put a good scare into her. I don't think Lainey even noticed that I never came in. By the time she got back to her bedroom, the lights were on and I sat up in bed, spread out with a couple of her old college photo albums. She walked into the room and stopped in her tracks. She looked at me, at the albums, and back to me. I think in that moment, we both knew it was over. 
He wasn't in there, she said after a long pause. I know what you're thinking, but it wasn't him. Nobody was in there. Fine, I said. But he was on the monitor. You know he was on the monitor. Why, Lainey? She looked down at the albums, the old pictures from which Will Harding's dumb fucking face grinned up at both of us. Father. She looked at me, the guilt shone in her eyes. Will's the father, not me, Will Harding. She started to cry. I stood up and walked out of the room, pausing a few inches from her face, just to say softly, almost sweetly, you're a real bitch, you know that? And then I left the house and never walked back inside. Lainey brought all my stuff to the new apartment a couple days later. The divorce went through quickly. She didn't want it, but she understood. She, of course, got custody of Annika, having the tremendous advantage of not only womanhood, but of being the actual biological parent. I didn't fight it. It's amazing how quickly I stopped loving both of them. Will Harding was a big, brash man. He had tattoos, muscles, and watched football and drank beer, then got mean when he did. That's why Lainey left him after two passionate, terrible years. She once told me she married me because I was everything Will was not. But it wasn't long before she realized that, by the same token, Will was everything I was not. I guess old habits die hard. And three months after Annika was born, so did Will. He found out that Lainey had had a baby and came to the house. She shut him out, screaming at him that he wasn't the father, he wasn't, he wasn't. But he knew she was lying. So he got real drunk and real mad. He didn't put a seatbelt on. And on his way back to our place, he sped his fucking Camaro up a curb into a big brick mailbox. Lainey went to his fucking funeral. She told me that she was going to get her teeth cleaned. She sent me a Christmas card last year. She and Annika, smiling underneath a wreath in cheesy red sweaters. Stockings hung on either side of them. I looked at that little girl I used to call mine, now seven years old, and felt nothing. I wondered absently if I should feel guilty. And if I'd somehow failed as a dad. But those thoughts, often though they come, never lasted long. She didn't need another father. She already had one after all. And she seems to like him just fine. I hope you guys enjoyed the story. I really liked it. I liked family kind of ones, even though this one wasn't exactly a happy one. Although, how many creepy pastas are actually happy ones? You need some feels pastas. Maybe I should do some feel pastas. I like those, but they make me cry because I'm a wimp. I'm a baby now. But I hope you ghouls liked it. I always like the ones with like baby monitors. Like they always freak me out because we still use them for my son because he's like way upstairs and we're downstairs, our bedroom. So I, just in case he wakes up or something so we can hear him. And even though, you know, spirits and stuff is normal for me, it's still, like, creepy to just think of, like, someone that's not my kid speaking through it. You know what I mean? And we have, like, an old school one. We don't have, like, a cool picture thing. But, oof. It's like an, it's like an irrational fear of, like, looking at, like, a video baby monitor Question of the day. Those of you who have, like, younger siblings or children or, you know, nieces or nephews, if you've ever watched them, have you ever heard or seen anything, like, creepy AF on a baby monitor? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, ghouls, the last video will be on the top left. The next video will be on the bottom left. All my social medias are on the screen, as well as in the description box below. And remember, there's always someone 
or something watching you.